Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the 1970, mm, 1964 TR4 uh, on the Rusty Beauties channel. In, uh, in the last episode we took the engine apart, not completely, we took the top end out. Well, you see now it is taken apart completely, but that's because I was planning to put everything together in one video about the disassembly, but it became too long. So now, since I split the video in two, I have to make a new intro for it. So. Hi guys, welcome to the second part of the engine disassembly. So very quick recap from the last video. We removed the flywheel, the clutch, all the auxiliary parts, we removed the head, we removed the rocker shaft, we removed the push rods. We found out that one of the push rods was badly bent. We also removed the camshaft and we figured that it is worn. We took out also the tappets and we found that they are damaged and one of them was even broken and that's where we stopped. So in this video, let's start taking apart the bottom end and see what's going on there. It's gonna be interesting too, so stay with me. So all the bolts on the oil sump are removed except this one which goes into the ceiling block here in the front you see and the ceiling block is made out of aluminum so or aluminium and you should be very careful when you're assembling it not to over torque this one so i don't know if this one is over torqued i think because of the leak somebody came here and torqued this in the front and i'm afraid that this might be a problem now here because my gun couldn't take it out. So I have to remove it manually and I'm going to be very careful here. Hopefully the threads on the block won't come out together with the, with the boat. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that hard. But let's see. looks clean <laughs> no aluminium <laughs> there's something inside <clears throat> disappeared look at all the silicone on the bottom of the oil pan so you see that's why I don't like using silicone because it falls and pieces of this might end up in uh, the oil galleries and clog them and you can have issues because of that. There was something metal but now it disappeared. Maybe I lost it. Oh, it probably came off the <laughs> probably came out of the drain plug. Anyways, there was something metal inside. Maybe it's piece yeah, it's probably a piece from the Tappet, you know, one tappet is broken. Let's take the tappets out actually. Okay, so I'm gonna use the back of this number one. Okay, so that's number one, of course, not good. Number two, same thing. Okay, the heater came on, so I had to put my wireless mic. I'm sorry, in some of the videos I know the heater is making a lot of noise and it's, the audio is bad, so anyways. So that's number three now, let's see. Number three. The face is bad, but also look at that. A piece is missing. Number four, they're all bad. So yeah, we're gonna have to buy new ones anyways. Since we're buying a new camshaft, it's always a good idea to buy a new, new tappets as well. Well, it's actually a good idea to buy everything new, right? <laughs> well, not really, because I don't want a new car. I want an old car. The 
That's why I would never restore a car, especially my own car. I would never just restore the car and measure the compression of the engine and say, you know what? It's a good compression, so I'm just gonna put the engine in anymore. I've done that once <laughs> on my Spitfire and it's, it's a bad thing. So you see how much sludge is it? Anyway, I'll take the pump apart as I'm taking it out. I can just take these three nuts and take the whole pump together, but I want to take it apart to inspect it anyways, and it is easier to take it apart here because it's like on a vice, you know. So here, here this seems nice and smooth, it's not scored or anything. The rotors also have pretty good face here, so they look good. So I'm gonna reach underneath with the distributor drive shaft and gear, and I'll try to spin the pump, because I want to position it in certain way so I can measure it. Now there's three measurements here. If you're watching this video together with my GT6 engine rebuild video, you might hear pretty much the same things, but this is for the people who are watching this series as series, you know? So that's why I'm repeating pretty much the same things all over again. So the measurements here must be maximum four thousandths between the inner and the outer rotor. So we have outer rotor that spins outside and the inner rotor. So we're going we're gonna to take them out soon and you're going to see them better. So I'm going to take the four thousandths leaf here come on oh that's pretty loose that's very loose let's measure another one <laughs> my glove yeah that's very loose here yep so i'm gonna try with six Six is loose. Let's try eight. Yeah, eight is tight. Eight is tight. So this is eight tau here. Well, it must be between one and four tau, the gap between the inner and the outer rotor. The gap between the outer rotor and the housing must be maximum 10 tau. So I have nine here. So let's try with nine. No, nine won't fit. Let's try four again. Oops, that's four plus something. Four plus six. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would say that's about four. Okay. So this must be maximum 10. So this gap is good, but the one inside, which is the more important actually, because that's going to lose oil pressure there between the inner and the outer rotor, that is a little bit too big. And the last measurement that we need to take here is the flat on top. So we can take a flat edge and go like this. This needs to be maximum 4 tau. And it is less than four. That's four tau that I'm measuring with, and that's much less. So I can't even put it inside. So that's good. I believe we should buy, they sell only the rotor and the vine separately, they call it, which is the inner and the outer rotor. So let me try and take them out. I will push with a long extension from underneath. There you go. That's the outer rotor. That comes out like this. They don't look too bad, but that measurement is a little bit worrying. And now we're gonna take it out completely.
Now this here is interesting that there's a gasket or there must be a gasket here which is missing here. <laughs> That's interesting. On TR6 engine there's no gasket here. On the TR4 engine and TR3 and 2 of course there must be gasket here. So now let's see what other problems we have here. I can notice something right away. Here on TR4 engine there is a tub washer here going to the two bolts of the connecting rods and they are missing here and they just put lock washers here which is not a good idea. So anyway, let's see now. Somebody told the owner of the car before that uh, he needs uh, main bearings and maybe the big end bearings here. So I don't feel any play. No, they don't seem bad. I was hearing some kind of a knock when I was starting the engine, but maybe it was something else. I was expecting that one of the connecting rods would have a significant play. Oh, maybe this one. Oh yeah. I don't know if you're gonna be able to hear it, but I'm gonna zoom you in so you can see it. I can feel it with my fingers that it's making a knock. All right, anyways, I want to measure the end play of the crankshaft before I do anything else. Let's see if it moves. I don't think it has any, which is weird. Wow, there's absolutely no end play. Let's measure it. Ha, you see, it's super tight. It has two, two and a half tau of end play, it should be between 6 and 8, so I'm sure that somebody jammed their uh, plus 5 thrust washers. We will see when we take them out. Anyways, that's too tight. We don't want too big of an end play, but we don't want it to be so tight either. Actually, I almost forgot. Let's first, before we start taking anything out, let's first make sure that the connecting rods are matching the numbers and the main caps as well. So, let's see first. Number one and four. Okay, these are matching. One and four. And now let's see these two two and three numbers are matching good the cups I don't see a number here on the cup hmm. and I don't see a number here on the side of the block Okay, these cups cannot be mixed, that's why they are not numbered, I guess. But you can see here that uh, for the orientation only, so you don't turn them around. Well, this one you can't, but the number one and number two, I believe you can. No, number one you can't turn around either. So it's only this one that can be turned around. But you see here, you have the numbers 9, 4 and L punched and you have the same here, L and 9 and 4, and here L, 9 and 4. So that tells us that it was assembled correctly. Anyway, so now we can start taking out the connecting rods. The bearing doesn't look bad. I mean, there's scratches. It is scored a little bit, but that's normal. Let's push this out. Now I don't want to drop also the liners down yet because it's going to be much easier to measure them as they are in the block. We're going to take them out eventually at some point but 
I'm gonna try to keep them in the block for now. If they come out, they come out. Now it looks to me like these are new bearings. Oh look, there's a fourth, even a fourth ring here. Looks like these are new pistons and new rings. I can't see any numbers here, but let's see what the bearings say in the back. Okay, let me let's try to take this one out. <coughs> Standard. Anyways, I'm curious to see what the top of the piston says. Okay, that also says standard, but standard to which size? <laughs> because there are three different sizes for these liners. 86 millimeters, 87, I don't remember, but we're gonna see. But that's interesting with this extra oil ring here. And even with extra oil rings, it was burning oil. There was a lot of blow by. Yeah, there's multiple scratches here. I don't know why it looks like that. Same here. Yeah, I can hear it. I don't know if you can hear it. I'm gonna put the mic a little bit closer. The heater is still running, so I don't know if you're gonna hear it. So here is where our knock was coming from. So let's see, hopefully it's only the bearing that is worn. Hopefully the shaft is not damaged here. Nothing wrong with the bearing other than the scoring, which was everywhere on the other ones too. So that tells me that maybe this crank pin is smaller than the other ones. I can't wait to measure it. All right, so now let's remove the ceiling block from here and then the cups so we can remove the crankshaft. There's some interesting gaskets here that are really hard to put back on after. So the threads here are still good, looks like, because sometimes these get stripped. These are for the front cover here. So if they get over torqued, they get stripped and then you need a new ceiling block, but this one looks good. Now we don't need this anymore. Now here, if I remember well, the torque must be about 100 pounds, so I might be a little bit too optimistic with this wrench, but <laughs> with this ratchet, but <coughs> yeah, <laughs> I need something more sturdy than that. Yeah, you see, these are new. So what happened, I believe, is that somebody changed the pistons and the liners. They're not the original, but they are the standard size. So somebody changed the pistons and hopefully the liners. And these bearings are, oh, these might be the original actually. PV, but no size. PV or VP, 2475. So these might be the original bearings here. Oh, 
Okay, let's see the thrust washers. They're also standard, looks like, doesn't say anything. You see how it is worn here? And it's even like the metal has been displaced into inside, so it was hitting a lot here somehow. But no numbers, again it says PV, so it looks like they're the standard size. And this cup is usually a problem to come out. Wow. Yeah. Then we're gonna do a trick that I normally do. We're gonna make ourselves handles. Wow. And it still doesn't move. I'm gonna break the wrenches. I need more solid wrenches. <laughs> These are gonna snap on me. I'm gonna literally bend them and break them. Okay, we need to step our game up. <coughs> wow! Oh! the shell came out too. So let's talk a little bit about this rear seal. The rear seal on TR4, on TR2, 3 and 4 engines is actually not a seal, it is a, an oil pump, literally, that takes all the oil that goes in that direction and literally shoots it back inside. So how it works is there's this scroll which is spiral. So if you look at this, it's like threads. It starts from here. Let me show you. So this is where it starts, you see? And now if you follow this groove, you will see that it's gonna take us, it's like a thread, you see? It takes us inside the engine. So this channel on the crankshaft, along with the same channel on the seal, and we have another shell underneath here, you see? So these two shells go together around that screw and as the crankshaft is spinning, the oil gets shot back inside because that's how the shell goes. There's a hole here and that hole leads inside the engine. So that's the idea. So that should work well when the crankshaft is spinning. What happens when it's not spinning? <laughs> that's the fun part that these engines leak mostly when they're sitting, not when they're running. And that's the reason why, because when they're running, the scroll, even if it's worn, it, sh it shoots the oil back in. But when you stop the engine, the crankshaft stops turning, and all the oil that is on the walls of the crankcase starts seeping a little bit between the seal and the crankshaft, because now the scroll is not spinning, and it is leaking out. Now the engineers also put a little bit of thought in that. They have a hole here, you see, at the bottom in this channel after the seal. So that's on the outside, right? Because that's the bottom shell. It goes like this, but that's the bottom. And here behind, on the outside of the scroll, there's this channel and this hole. And through this hole, this residual oil is supposed to leak out. It lines up with this hole, which also leads inside the engine. For one reason or another, I guess this gets clogged here and it doesn't leak inside the engine, it leaks out of the engine. So these engines are notorious for leaking after they are turned off. There are conversions available here. One requires machining here, so you can install a regular rubber seal. There's another one that doesn't require machining, it just uses this surface of the crank, which is after the seal. So we'll see, maybe we're gonna buy one of these conversion kits and we're gonna convert this one. All right, let's take out the crank now. Oh, dropped one of the thrust washers. All right, the only thing that we need to take apart is the head. And actually I should do that so we can see if we need new valves or not. 
the liners also need to be taken out but like i said i'm gonna keep them on the block for now so i can measure them easily you know what let's take apart the head quickly so we can see what the condition of the valves is then i'm gonna take the risk and make this video way too long but uh, i want to also measure the crankshaft and the liners so this way by the end of this video we're gonna know exactly what we need to buy for this engine and we will know also whether the crankshaft needs to be machined so the video might become a little bit too long but whatever let's finish everything all right to take the valves out i'm gonna use this tool that i made a long time ago which is basically a long reach clamp which i also welded uh, i believe this is a lock washer here but it works fantastic for me i love this too so Mm. Tighten it a little more. There you go. Come on. So here we have three springs. We have a spacer, then we have a bottom collar. Come on. There you go, bottom collar, one spring, second spring, and a third spring. And then we have a top collar. Wow, so many springs. So that's on the exhaust valve. Let's see the intake. Come on. So on the intake we only have two springs and we don't have a bottom collar. So we have the spacer again but we only have the two springs and a top collar, no bottom collar. We're gonna clean the valves after. And we're gonna inspect them together with the seats. That's the valve which had the bent push rod. Okay, the rest, I'm not gonna hold you here for the rest, I guess. Okay, so this is what the seats look like. The exhaust ones are pretty pitted. The intakes are nice and shiny. Um, here, this is exhaust again. This is exhaust. And the valves are the same, of course. So that's what the intakes look like. I have to clean them and decide what we're gonna do here. But the exhaust, especially the exhaust, I wanna clean them now and see what they look like. Maybe we can polish them with uh, the manual thing, you know, the, the manual tool because I don't want to lap them. I don't want to relap them with, uh, in a machine shop because look, that's pretty deep already. We don't want it to sink even deeper than that. I think it's been done once already. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, I don't see uh, on the most motors website, I don't see hardened seats for this head. You see this one, how much higher this one is? This one can be lapped in machine shop. But let me look at the other ones. This one is good. And this one is good. This is the only one which is pretty deep. Anyways, let me clean them a little bit on the wire wheel. And then we will see. We definitely need new guides because there's a lot of play here. I don't know if you see it, but I can visually see it. If I can see it, then it's a lot.
All right, I only cleaned the first three because even the valves don't look great. I don't know if you can see here, but there's pitting. If it is only the seats, that's fine. But if the valves are pitted, we can't do anything because the seats we can lock. The valves are not gonna get locked. They are hardened, so you see the pitting here? And that's the intake. Surprisingly, the intake is pitted. Maybe this cylinder was backfiring. This is the number three, actually. What I'm thinking here is that at some point it was backfiring, like uh, the engine was backfiring a lot, and that's when the push rod got bent, and that's why this valve is pitted. So anyway, we're gonna get new valves. Not gonna waste any more time cleaning them. We're gonna get new valves. We're gonna try to manually to lap them. And if that doesn't work well, then, well, we're gonna take it to a machine shop and they're gonna lap them with their professional equipment. But I believe that we can do it manually here. So, enough about the head. Well, actually for the head, we said also that we wanna inspect the shaft, right? The rocker shaft and see. So like I said, when you slide it, you can feel whether a, there's a ridge or not. And I can definitely feel one here. I already tried, like, it goes, but it, I can definitely feel a ridge right here on this and <clears throat> on this rocker. And here, I can't even move it, which is weird. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's a ridge here underneath. So we're gonna buy a new rocker shaft. Everything else is inspected, so so what's left is to measure the crankshaft and see what bearings we need to order and to measure the liners and see if we can keep these pistons and just re-ring them. Or we need to buy new liners and pistons and everything else. Let me just get cleaned and we're gonna start measuring quickly. All right, let's measure the journals first. Like I don't know the spec measurements and that's how I do it every time. I don't wanna know until I measure. We actually don't see anything from there, do you? All right, that's better, I guess. So I'm gonna measure, because these journals are so wide, I'm gonna measure a little bit on the left, a little bit on the right, and then we're gonna turn it and measure in different uh, orientation so we can judge a little bit better. So let's see what this hole shows here. Okay, let's see. Yeah, left and right are the same. This is the same, so it's not oval. Usually they don't get oval, but sometimes you can see they taper. One side is a little bit wider than the other side. No, that's good. So what does that show? That shows, so this is two to three inches. So that shows 2.4, 75, 79, and then Okay, they're pretty consistent. So now let's measure the four journals. Okay, so here's our problem with number one. So number one, I measured it like this first. Okay. So both sides are pretty consistent. And that shows, 
So 2.075 84 84 7 2.0 8 4 7 okay but then I turned the crankshaft this way and I measured this way which is perpendicular to what we measured before and this is 2.07581 so 2.081 5 So well, that's what we have when we measure two perpendicular to each other diameters. 2.0847 and 2.0815. That's uh, 15 to 47 is 32. 32 ten thousandths, which is 3.2 tau between one diameter to the other. So I'm going to do that again. Let me measure here just to make sure. So that's even smaller now I measure it, right? That's 75, 80, yeah, it's 8, 0. So these are all measurements that I took from this first pin, look. So this is the smallest one or even, no, this is the smallest one, and this is the biggest one. So we have 58 ten thousandths, or almost six tau difference between here and here. So this is the knock that I was hearing. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to machine those down all the pins to the next size. We will see what that is. Okay, I'm gonna keep measuring now. And let's see what the other ones show, in case there's one that is even smaller than this one. Okay. So this one is pretty consistent across all the directions, all the diameters. See, this one is tapered, so this is what this shows, from 810 to 820. So here we have one tau difference, but these two are in the same direction, one next to each other. One side is smaller, one side is bigger, so this one is tapered, and it is also oval by half a tau. So even this one is a little bit oval, from 55 to 88, that's 33, so 3.3 .3 tau. Well, obviously the pins need to be machined to the next size. I don't know about the journals. The journals are pretty consistent, but I don't know how close they are to the standard spec. Okay, so the last thing that I want to do before we are able to make the parts list is to measure the liners and determine whether we need new ones or not. I'm really hoping that these liners are good, like it looks, it looks like they are new, they've been replaced together with the pistons, so that's good, there's no ridge or anything, so I'm really hoping that the measurements are right, and we don't need to buy new ones, we just need new rings. So let's measure them. <laughs> just kidding you! Of course we're gonna use the right tools, but first of all, before we use the bore gauge, we're gonna have to determine how to set it up. We need to check the spec, but we don't know, but we don't know for what liners to check because there are three different types of liners. The TR2 and TR3 engines came with 83 millimeters bore of the liners. Some of the TR4 engines came also with uh, 83. It was optional, apparently, it says in the spec. But most of the TR4 and 4A engines came with uh, 86 millimeter bore. 
So what some of the TR2 and TR3 owners do, they also install TR4 liners with uh, 86 millimeter bore, and that's for increased uh, compression ratio and horsepower and everything. But what else you can find on the market, it's aftermarket liners that have 87, I believe, millimeters bore. So we don't know which liners we have here, 83, 86 or 87 millimeters. So before we go and check the spec, we have to figure this out. So that's why I have the calipers here, because very roughly we're going to measure what bore we have here in millimeters. 85.98. So we have 86 millimeters bore. So now let's go and check the spec. What is the exact measurement for 86 millimeters liners? So here is the spec. And you can see that uh, there are three different grades, F, G, and H, for 85-98 millimeters. So we're here, I guess, between 3.3854 and 3.3857. That's where we should be. So let's set up our bore gauge now. So I put my micrometer here on the vise with soft jaws so we don't damage it, like it's very lightly mounted there. And I don't know if you see here, but we are set to 3.3850. 3.3850. Let me look at this again. 3.3854857. So I set up my bore gauge in such way that when it shows 3.3850, So when it is there, at this measurement, it shows zero, you see? Okay, so that's good. So I set it a little bit smaller than what the spec measurement is. And now with the bore gauge, we're going to see how much bigger than that our cylinders are. So whatever the bore gauge shows, we're gonna have to add to 3.3850, you know what I mean? But the cylinders are so big, where do we measure? Do we measure like this? Do we measure like this? Do we measure at the top? Do we measure at the bottom? Where do we measure? Well, that's the thing now. We wanna measure in three different directions. What I normally do is why I measure perpendicular to the engine block, then I measure clockwise 60 degrees, and then I measure counterclockwise 60 degrees. And that gives me three different measurements 60 degrees apart of the same bore. And I can compare those measurements and see if my bore is still circle or it is out of round and became oval. So that's one of the things that we want to know, whether it is oval or still round. And uh, the other thing is, these three measurements, we're going to repeat somewhere at the top of the cylinder, then at the center, in the middle of the cylinder, and then at the bottom of the cylinder as well. And then when we compare the same measurement, the perpendicular one, for example, at the top, at the center, and at the bottom of the cylinder, that's going to tell us whether our cylinder is still a cylinder or it became taper, for example, or taper. So that's why we're going to take three measurements at three heights, and that's all together nine measurements, but we're gonna make sure that we always go this one first position, 60 degrees clockwise is gonna be second position, and 60 degrees counterclockwise it's gonna be third position, because this way we can compare the same position for each height. So let's take our nine measurements on our first cylinder. So we're gonna do that by putting our gauge inside, and that tells me that here we have 20, 25 ten thousandths of an inch more than the zero. So we have 25 ten thousandths above 2.3850. So I know that you don't see very well, but you're going to see my measurements in my third position, I guess. So that's 25. I'm going to mark that. My second position, we said, is clockwise. So that's 
38, uh, 36 actually. And my third position, now you're going to be able to see the gauge. My third position is, okay, that's big. Wow. Uh, it's, yeah, I would say 38 too. Okay, so now we're gonna do the same at the center and then at the bottom, and I'm gonna show you how we're gonna compare those. All right, so now here is what we can do with this information. So. You can see here I divided my page for the four cylinders and this is my number one cylinder. So I have here the first, second and third position and top, center and bottom. And these are my nine measurements here. So first of all, let's compare the, all the three positions at the top level of the cylinder. And that's gonna tell us how much we are out of round. So we're comparing the smallest measurement with the biggest measurement, which is 25 to 38. So we have 13 ten thousandths of an inch out of round here. Let's look at the middle level. So we have 23 to 26. Smallest is 23, biggest is 26. So we have three ten thousandths out of round here. And here we have 15 and 10. So we have five out of round here. So unfortunately, we have to look at the biggest one of these three and to consider that the out of round of our cylinder. So this cylinder out of round is 13. So now we can do the same thing. Compare the first position at all three levels. We have 25, 23, and 15. Our smallest measurement is 15, biggest measurement is 25, so we have taper of 10, 10 thousandths. Here though, now in second position, we have um, from 10 to 36, that's 26, 10 thousandths. So that's 2.6 tau, so that's a lot. Unfortunately, that's a lot. And here we have even more. Here we have from 10 to 38, that's 38, almost 3 tau taper. So that's 0, 0, 38, uh, sorry, 28. So our taper on this cylinder is uh, 0, 0, 28, the biggest one. And our max measurement, we're gonna have to find the biggest measurement here, which is 38, added to our 2.3, Eight five zero, so we have maximum measurement of three point three eight eight eight, right? Three point three eight five zero plus thirty eight is eighty eight. So we're gonna have to see how this measurement compares to our uh, spec. So that's it. These are the three measurements that we need and I'm gonna transfer these to my master sheet here, where we have the journals and the pins. So I'm gonna add the cylinders. I'm sorry, I made it dirty already. 3.3888. The taper was 28. And the out of round was 13. So I'm going to do the same now for second, third, and fourth cylinders, and then we're going to analyze our master sheet. So I'm actually expecting now number two, three, and four to be in much better shape. I believe this cylinder was damaged because of the oval crank pin. This one is tapered like a bucket, you know? That's normal. Always your uh, cylinders get worn at the top more and than at the bottom. All right, let's see these ones now. All right, so these are my final results and contrary to what I expected, actually there is a cylinder that is much worse than uh, number one even. 
as you can see here, number two, their measurements are pretty much the same. Uh, at the bottom it's 12, 16, 22, at the top it's up, up to 32. So our biggest measurement here is 32, we added that to 3.3850 and we have 3.3882, that's our maximum measurement and the out of round is 17 and the taper is 20. Same here pretty much for number 3, but look at number 4. So here we go up to 46. In third position at the top we have 46. This is the biggest number of the whole engine of all four cylinders. So at the out of round here goes up to 18. I think this is the biggest out of round. But look also at the taper here because at the bottom of this cylinder in third position we had only 11. So from 11 to 46, that's 35 ten thousands, three and a half tau taper. This is a lot. So I transferred all that information here. So unfortunately, with that taper and uh, with out and with this out of round, I think the out of round is eh, it's on the edge. I think 13 is okay. Up to 15, I believe, is okay. But 17, 18, that's too much. But the taper that's totally unacceptable. So I guess that's the reason why we have that uh, different compression in all the cylinders that we measured in combination with all the problems that we found on the crank pins. That was a really good idea to take this engine apart. The knock that I was hearing and the difference in the cylinders in compression told us enough that this engine has a problem. So anyways, last thing there's no point of looking at the cylinders anymore we're gonna have to buy new ones i have to buy pistons and liners together they come as a kit let's find the spec measurements for the pins and for the journals and compare that and see what we have to do with the crank all right these are the measurements so the crank pin needs to be between 2.0861 and 2.0866 and the main journal diameter needs to be between 2.4790 and 2.4795 so that's the standard all right so back on our sheet here we i transferred them here so this is our spec 2.4790 to 295 and we are right on on the journals so our journals are okay we need to order standard bearings standard main bearings right i'm surprised that the journals are okay and the pins are so bad like I don't know what happened. So this is the spec for the pins, 0861 to 0866. We are 0847815. So what's our smallest measurement here? We have 2.0788. So obviously we have to regrind our crankshaft, the pins only, not the journals, but the pins only. We need to grind them down to the next measurement, which is going to be 0 0.010 under that's gonna become 2.0761 to 2.0766 this is the next size bearings if we do that do we have any measurements that are smaller than that to smaller than 0 0.766 mm, no we have 2.0788 so we need bearings that are 0 0.010 here. All right, so now with all this information in hand and with all the parts assessment that we've done here, I, have, uh, I can go sit on the computer and order all the parts that we need. Unfortunately, it is more than what I expected but it is what it is. I'm glad that we took this engine apart because you see it had so many issues. I haven't, actually I haven't seen an engine that was worse than that, even though it was running not too bad. I'm really surprised with this camshaft, with this different compression on the cylinders, with this bent push rod, all these issues combined, I don't know how it was running. The only thing that I had suspic suspicious on was the crankshaft because of the knock that I was hearing. But other than that, I wasn't expecting it to be that bad. So that's going to be it. It was a long video, I know. I'm sorry. So I'm not going to rumble. 
too much at the end of it. Uh, let's order parts and I'll see you in the next one. So thanks for watching, thanks for commenting and subscribing, sharing, supporting the channel, all these good things guys. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.